Hi, and welcome to episode 97 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, PhD <laughs> student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Hi, I'm Heidi Parker. I'm a postdoc at the University of Austin in Texas. And uh, this week, we're, we're getting further out of the science field uh, and getting more into the science communication field. Um, this week, we're talking with Rob Nelson, who is the director of Untamed Science. Uh, welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell everybody at home who you are and, and what it is that you do? Yeah, uh, my name is Rob Nelson, and I make science films for everybody to enjoy. I, uh, I got a degree in science originally, so I was a marine biologist, and now all I do is I work with scientists uh, in all sorts of different disciplines to try to tell the story that they're, you know, whatever they're researching. Sweet. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good job description to have. Well, it's really fun because I think when I was studying fish, in my case, I, I really, I got antsy, and I just, all I wanted to do was learn all sorts of different things, and this allows me to do that. I don't have to spend too long, a week or two, on any one thing, and then I move on, and I'm still doing science, and that I'm learning, and then I'm kind of researching it in my own way, and then communicating. I'm just not, you know, crunching numbers anymore. That's, that sounds awesome. So we had a, a month, sort of this alternative October, we had a month of people doing careers that weren't just straight PI or postdoc. And we'd ask people to tell a little bit about their story. Can you tell a little bit about your background and the path that took you to where you are today? Yeah, so um, I started out, I'll kind of start back from the very beginning. I thought that I wanted to be a marine biologist because I saw Jack Cousteau on TV and his you know, videos about the natural world were just really amazing. And so I started on a path to become a marine biologist and you know, that led me to my uh, University of Miami, did an undergrad there. I went to Australia where I met most of the people that I work with now uh, doing re uh, research. And then I went to the University of Hawaii in Manoa and studied uh, coral reef fish, in fact, uh, population ecology. I did that for five years. I uh, decided to, to get out with just a master's um, because I found a program at Montana State that was actually doing science and natural history filmmaking. And when I realized that there was actually a program to do just that, I was like totally blown away because when I, you know, the more I started to research, the more I started to realize that Jack Cousteau was not the marine biologist that I was training to be. Jack Cousteau was a filmmaker, an explorer, you know, an engineer, um, and that if I kind of was still as inspired as I was when I was a kid, that Jack Cousteau was in this next program, and uh, that's in doing science communication, and so I got a second master's degree in science and natural history communication, and um, you know that, and that actually led to me starting a company called The Wild Classroom, which then morphed into what is now Untamed Science. And I started it with uh, four other people, um, Jonas, Hazen, and Haley. And then um, here we are today. Actually, the most of what we've done in the past is doing science textbooks. Um, so this, anybody that's ever used this textbook. <laughs> Or more recently, this high school textbook. We're inside those. We have the complimentary videos that go with them. I don't know how many people actually use those, but we did their high school, middle school, elementary school, uh, chemistry, physics, everything. We did 500 videos in total for that. And then we stopped doing that because uh, textbooks are kind of going down the twos as far as everybody wants everything online. And so we decided we're going to start putting everything on our uh, that we do online as well. And that's more or less kind of full history up till to where we are right now. <laughs> That's great. It's, yeah. it's crazy the way that, you know, the way that we learn science and the way that things are presented has changed so much since when we were growing up. Uh, it, it must have taken a big leap from you after your master's program to starting a company. Was that really scary for you? Well, um, you know, it was interesting. I, <clears throat> when I was in grad school, this was 2003, I, I actually started a company before all that called Explore Biodiversity. And uh, what I would do is every class that I went to, I would create a web page. So uh, my ornithology class, Life of Birds website. I had a bugs website. I had a plants website. What else did I have? A mammals website, fish website. I mean, it was all these different things. And what I started to realize was just putting, up, putting them up online for fun, people started to view my content. And it was kind of an addicting cycle. I didn't know my career path in the end was to start a company. You know, I, I did it for tax purposes at first. And, um, yeah, it just it snowballed, and um, 
I think it, that that starting a company is the biggest learning process that I've had to go through, and it's something that biologists in general don't do. They don't learn how to be a businessman, but everybody should be in the business of selling themselves, especially biologists. I do it all the time now because I'm a filmmaker and i got to sell my services, but um, if that was one thing I could teach biologists, that's what it would be probably, <laughs> how to be their own businessman. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that uh, we see not so so well done in a lot of cases in scientists, and, and not only not well done, but a lot of pushback for the, the dirty S word of self-promotion, which... Uh, uh, you know, I think it's starting to maybe go away in some circles, you know, it being a dirty word, but uh, I think it's a, still a very strong uh, factor in many people's opinions. Well, and you have to, um, if we're talking about self-promotion, you always got to do it in a way that your colleagues don't think you're a douchebag, you know, right? <laughs> so, but, um, you know, from a business point of view, your marketing, letting people know who you are, is a big part of it, and you obviously do it really well um, because uh, Twitter is that marketing tool. The more you're putting out stuff, interacting with people, that's your marketing. And it doesn't have to be anything bigger than that. Of course, this podcast is pretty cool too. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what we do to try and works, and uh, and uh, yeah, it, it it's kind of fun. And I think that I think that this blending of of taking you know personal social lives and research social lives and mm -hmm. and mashing them all up online, I think is what's doing a lot of that breaking down of the barriers and and allowing people to to see each other both as scientists outside their discipline and scientists within their discipline um, as people rather than as competitors as much. There's still some of that as well. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think the other thing that it does, in my natural history filmmaking program, we, we actually studied doing feminist type films. And one of the, the ways that we kind of did that was to portray scientists outside of the lab maybe interview them in, in their kitchen as they're cleaning up with kids running around or whatever. Um, you know, take away that kind of typical scientist profile where they're, you know, arms crossed, the camera's a little lower, there's this sense of power and domination. It doesn't, man or woman, it doesn't matter who's in front of the camera. And this kind of sense that they know everything and take it back to reality. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I see the parallels there. Yeah, I think even when you're, even as a postdoc or as a graduate student, when you TA, for classes of undergraduates, when they ask a question and you say, well, I don't know, we don't know that. I think things like that really break down, you know, a lot of those barriers. Um, but yeah, back to the, you know, the technology and the techniques that you use are amazing because these are really great for kids. You know, we saw such a huge rise in kids using the Nature Finder app and, you know, all this stuff. And I, yeah, I think what you've been able to do is amazing and it makes science more digestible for those mm. kids. Yeah, and I, you know, I, for you two, I don't know which one of, or which ones of my videos you've seen. Maybe Morgan, you could put a link to the videos that I've done with Bugs, with uh, Misha and Michelle, because I know, at, at least with those, one of the things that I really tried to do was show uh, both Misha and Michelle in kind of more of a real world setting, kind of more of a behind the scenes feel, like putting camp GoPros on the car, getting reactions as we're going places, instead of like, let's set you down in the lab and let's do an interview, and then I'll mix in some pretty footage. Because um, that's not something that a lot of natural history filmmakers are doing these days. Um, uh, some people, but I think I, I, I would like more and more people to do that because I, I think this sense of reality is some is really important for people to know like what is a real scientist doing? This this is what it is right there. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, and and we will definitely have links to to all of Rob's films, not all of them directly, but uh, to his website, to his YouTube channels, on our website at breakingbio.com, where you can find all the show notes for for everything like usual. Um, but I, I think you bring up a really good point because I have watched a lot of your videos in the last you know, year, year and a half, two years, however long I've started following you guys. Um, and you guys have got a, a very distinctive style to your videos where um, it's not only like hands-on where you guys are literally rafting through uh, the river or, or whatever you're doing or shooting bows and arrows, doing a lot of hands-on stuff rather than being talking to people doing that. But you're also feel, make the viewer feel like they're embedded in the project. Um, which I think particularly shines in the Arthropods of Your Homes uh, series, which you, you alluded to, um, and which has obviously been in the news a lot this week. Um, 
as the paper had just come out, where the people are, you know, you've got your, your filmmaking style and the way that you're talking to the, the researchers as well as having them explain what they're doing makes the viewer feel like they are, you know, in a house in South Carolina or San Francisco or, you know, down on their hands and knees uh, on the dirt floor in a Peruvian hut. Um, and I, I think that's a, a different style because a lot of people, when they think of nature documentaries, I imagine most will think of the David Attenborough BBC style where it's a talking head talking over video of captured from afar. Yeah, I mean, I think that's ch the, uh, the idea of what people see as interesting and engaging is constantly changing. Um, and I think that as filmmakers, we do also um, copy the styles of different other people. I did not have this style when I started, but I, I also got a lot of um, negative feedback when I started filmmaking that I was always in my films. People were like, it's not always about you, but I'm like, well, it's my story. I'm... I'm telling it, and so I, I always kept myself in it. But um, uh, yeah, you know, I I try to adapt what I'm doing constantly, and I, I find now kids and everybody is, they're so used to seeing things on YouTube that I've started to not even bring my cameraman anymore. I, I'll just hold the camera because I feel like there's this sense that it's more real. You know, if I have somebody with a super nice camera and super nice lens, and it's all set up my shot. Um, even though I'm going to say the exact same thing, if I'm just holding it out there, it feels, I don't know, it feels more real. And it's kind of taking elements of documentary style elements that you see on YouTube and kind of incorporating them into your films. This is kind of what I've been doing, yeah. Yeah, the vlog effect, essentially. Yeah, yeah, you could call it that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a study done about, um, I think it was conservation and the environment, but they looked at like Latin America versus Europe and where the, where the reader is placed in the story. And in Latin America, they're almost taking part in the stories. They're part of the ecosystem. They're part of you know, the problem or the solution, where more often than not in Europe, you're just the observer. And one of the things that always struck me about you know, your videos that I've seen is you feel like you're part of it, which makes you know, the kids and the viewers feel like you know, this is something that they're involved in. I yeah, think that's really important. Well, no, I, I appreciate that, and I um, uh, one of the things that I'm learning a lot right now is how to use more GoPros. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there as a little thing because GoPro came with us uh, and shot for a week last Thanksgiving, or this this last Thanksgiving. They took 30 GoPros and they mounted them everywhere and hit record, and then we did our thing. And so, if what you saw with what we're doing feels immersive, imagine it with GoPros everywhere recording everything. Um, so anyway, everything's changing all the time. Just trying to stay up. Feels like it's changing too fast sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, because you started out with like Jacques Cousteau and all this marine stuff, mm -hmm. are the fish stories still your favorites? Are those the ones that are closest to your heart? Um, well, they're the closest to my heart because I feel like that's my roots. But... Um, I feel like I take different taxonomic groups, and I have phases. I don't know if you guys are like that. Well, you're bug people, but maybe you have different bug taxonomic groups that you go through. But I, um, I have, I had a bird phase in college, and then uh, I had a bug phase, definitely a fish phase, a coral phase. Um, I had a plants phase, which uh, I'm slowly getting out of into a mushroom phase. I'm really into the mushroom tax right now. So I don't know. It cha it's constantly evolving and changing. <laughs> I had a nudibranch phase where I was oh, really... Nice. Yeah, where I was Never really hard to that. Yeah. that. That could be a good one to pick up. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Because, you know, we learn about so many things. If you just... Like, I'm a behavioral ecologist, and when I sit back, mm -hmm. and especially at meetings, when you hear about these different groups, you're like, God, birds can be amazing, you know? Right. You can really get pumped about these things. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I have not read a fiction book. It's, I'm, it's kind of sad to say in since I was in college, probably. All I read is field guides and scientific, you know, little... So sometimes that kind of sound like fiction ones, you know, the narrative type things, but yeah, that's all I read. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm the same. Non-fiction or go home at the, this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much, there's so many interesting animals and plants and different things. It's like, wow, you gotta learn about those. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Evolution's imagination is a hell of a lot better than any humans, as far as I can tell. So yeah, yeah. we'll work That's with that. True. I was going to ask him about the arthropods in our home video. Like, mm -hmm. what was your sort of basis or inspiration for this? Okay, yeah. So the arthropods in our home thing is really. Um, it's something that we're not done with yet. It's going to be a seven-part series in that we're going to go to uh, homes on all seven continents. So we've already done San Francisco. We actually did one in North Carolina, which was the inspiration. I'll get to that in a sec. And then we did a the Amazon. We did Sweden. And then we're planning a trip to Africa right at the moment, which should be really cool. Um, uh, but, yeah, the really the inspiration to it is that I had a weekly podcast, and Michelle, um, along with Matt Bertone, um, we're, we're in North Carolina doing all this research and I needed topics and so I said do you guys mind if I follow you You know, when you're doing these bugs in the home study and they said sure and so I just shot for four hours with them put up the first video and um, uh, I've always wanted to work with Michelle in some fashion and she offered to pay for my accommodation and travel basically to do this next project um, and so I said yeah let's do it and so that kind of led to all of the rest of the stuff. Um, and, and Michelle's kind of treating me as um, less of just a hired filmmaker and more of like their education specialist. So I'm kind of trying to take everything that we do and make it bigger. So we did an episode on you know Discovery News and we've been pitching some National Geographic um, type TV things and you know we'll see if any anything else comes of it. I would watch that. I would watch that in a second before like mermaid beasts or whatever. Oh my gosh. Ah, <laughs> some of the stuff out right now is ridiculous. That's a different topic probably, but <laughs> Yeah. No, I I agree and I think I think this is something we're seeing maybe pick up more often is people bringing in professional communicators on their big grants um to to fill out that that broader impact section of, of NSF grants and uh, I think it's best for everybody uh, you know it takes a load off the, the research team's plate themselves that they can they can help spread um, some money out as well as as the time necessary and learning necessary to do it um, and then everybody else gets the, these stellar stellar products at the end of it that help explain and through the process of what's going on mm -hmm. um, so how, how would you recommend scientists uh, finding and getting in touch with people like yourself? Um, well, obviously, you can go to Untamed Science if you want to get old me. It just I mean, <laughs> no, I will help you on anything you want. Um, there's a, there are, um, anybody that comes from the Montana State program is stellar. It's they're really the only program of its kind, um, other than the program in New Zealand. Um, uh, it's just not as many people come from that, and they're usually from New Zealand. But um, I would say, and it's often hard to find the documentaries that exist. Um, but but um, I could put people in touch. Obviously, if if they're in like the East Coast or the West Coast, a lot of my friends are in those places. I can find somebody that's local for them to work with. There's not really a, like a good place to go and like connect with, uh, you know, connect uh, scientists to the science communicator folks. Um, that's one thing that's lacking right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I'll just throw out that I would agree with you, Morgan, that it's really important, I think, to try to collaborate with somebody who does this as their job. Um, it doesn't have to be doing films. It, you know, obviously, whatever it is, I'm a big proponent of films, though, because I think in two minutes, you can summarize what somebody, you know, what might take 30 minutes to read in a paper but do it in such a way that's so visual and so powerful that, and it evokes emotion, that it's, it's going to get people excited, if not convince them that what you're doing is really, really important. And that's part of the business side of it. You, you want people to think what you're doing is important. And if you don't do that, then maybe you don't get the grants. I don't know how. How it works in those meetings. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's something for the broader impacts that everyone should be looking at. You know, and people are like, oh, can I afford this? But like, can you? You know, it's so competitive to get grants. You can reach so many people if you put the money and the time and invest that into making a video about your research that will reach so many people. Yeah, and you know, um, sometimes it's hit or miss on how many people you end up reaching with films. Like I've done films as scientists and there's like a thousand people. You know, that's on the low end for us. Sometimes it blows up and it goes to a hundred thousand right away. Um, 
but you can share it with anybody that's interested in what you're doing. Instead of sending them your paper, you can send them a little summary via the video, and I think it's highly effective because people are used to seeing videos of things. They, they almost are demanding that there's a video of something to watch. Yeah, so so that brings us. You you mentioned it earlier, and we might as well swing over to it now. Um, how you you guys have changed a, a bit of your business model from from working for a publisher for a, a somewhat closed publishing uh, house to to more of an open style where you're doing a lot of YouTube stuff. How has that transition been? Um, and and you know navigating the YouTube space, which uh, as somebody looking out and watching a lot of stuff online, uh, seems like it's uh, a really you know, competitive and and exciting place to be right now. Yeah, YouTube is a um, really exciting and also very frustrating place to be at times because um, it's exciting because you can reach a lot of people, potentially. It's frustrating because there is this idea that everybody is starting in the same place and that... If you want to do something, you just put it up. That's the idea. But what you don't realize is that a lot of the big YouTubers have a lot of money. <laughs> or they're fully funded. Nobody tells you if they are or not. If you're on TV, you know more or less what people's budgets are. But on YouTube, you don't. And you don't know um, if it's just somebody doing it for fun or not. But you're always comparing yourself to everybody else. So, I mean, from a creator standpoint, it's, it's it can be frustrating and depressing at times, but I think that's probably true with any creative field. Um, you know, uh, just kind of throwing out s some things, uh, YouTube is, is difficult because w we were lucky enough to have started everything that we're doing because of the publishing company. So they helped us get our infrastructure set up in that, you know, uh, uh, myself and Jonas Hazen, um, and also now my wife, Haley, uh, we were able to have cameras that we needed to tell stories, to have editing equipment. All that stuff is, you know, it's expensive. You're probably looking at, like, five grand startup costs to, like, really have a decent setup. Um, but it also helped me pay off my student loans so I don't have to be like, searching out and, like, tied to a, a day job. And then uh, it gave me the ability to work on my trade and be able to, like, tell all these stories. Um... Right after that, they actually also funded about uh, six months of us doing weekly podcasts, which on YouTube, to start to get a following is really difficult. You guys probably know that. Unless you get, like, featured on iTunes or something, you're, nobody's ever going to find you. And so it's just really hard to, like, slowly move up that ladder. Um, we're at the stage now where, fortunately, we have just enough people that are following us that if something is, like, you know, really good. It, it gets shared around, and sometimes things get shared via YouTube search and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's difficult. I, I could talk about YouTube all day, Morgan. <laughs> I, I constantly am talking about it, and my wife won't talk about it with me. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find other people to talk about it with. So, but I won't, good. I won't talk about it nonstop. Now. I think our problem, our problem is that our followers are scientists who don't talk to anyone else. So. <laughs> We can't spread by word of mouth. <laughs> that's not true, everybody that's listening. You know, you can go and tweet all about this or share it with your friends and family. <laughs> well, you know, we you... Love you. Please, we are certainly bowing down to our, our lowly listeners. Share. Well, you touched on something interesting because um, I think audience is really important for anybody. It's the first thing you got to think about if you're communicating something. Our original audience were teachers. To you know, that we wanted people to use these in their classroom. The problem with teachers as well on YouTube is that if you, I'm just going to throw this out here, if you're over 30, you don't use YouTube like most people, or like YouTube is designed to be used, and that you subscribe, and you every day you pull up your subscribers, you see who's made a video, and you watch them. Um, they're just getting it through their feed, and so we weren't getting a lot of that, like, viral movement. Um, and so we kind of shifted gears, and we started making videos that were less, like, tied to lessons. You know, we, did, we stopped making videos up like photosynthesis 101 and we make it like wire leaves green you know something like that and we actually got a little more traction that way and something I've just been learning trying to figure out myself yeah the, the clickbait is real no matter which venue you like to play in yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> so so I think that's a pretty good segue so now we're talking about you know YouTube all these different things um, and I think that's a pretty good segue to something else that you guys are, are getting more invested in and that's helping others um, follow in your footsteps and, and get into the game to some degree 
as well. So you've got a, a special YouTube channel um, that's tangential to your, your main Untamed Science, uh, where you guys have been posting weekly videos on how to do it. And then you've also authored a book in the last little bit, which is uh, How to Make Science in Nature Films. And I, I really like the tagline up at the top, um, which is, you can see it says, How You Can Change the World Using Your Video Camera. Um, can you explain, you know, share a little bit about what your strategy is and why you're giving away these trade trade secrets trade secrets air quotes uh, for for doing what you do? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Um, it is interesting that you bring up like why are you giving away the secrets? Because I talk to a lot of the friends in my program, um, like asking them often, like, how did you do this or how did you do that? And a lot of times I get resistance. People are like, you know what, I'm not going to tell you because then you're going to start doing it. And with the internet now, this stuff is already out there. And so it's like, why would you not want to, like, encourage other people to learn this stuff and provide an easy place? Because you're not going to be giving away something that nobody knows how to do. And I also see it as it's probably better if I'm the one giving the stuff away. <laughs> It's kind of a weird, I don't know, what's the behavioral ecology term for that if you're the one that spills the secrets? and. <laughs> but, yeah, the cost-benefit. You look like, you know, you you, yeah, you look like you're being helpful. Yeah, but, you know, I don't have quite such a devious view on it. I actually also am a teacher. Uh, I think that uh, my background, I, I spent four years when I was in grad school also teaching undergraduate labs, and it was one of the things I enjoyed most was that teaching. And now I spend all my time, you know, here in front of a computer in my studio and being able to do videos like this that are helpful to other people and little tutorials I find I get the most comments from and so it's kind of a cycle you know you, you make a video a tutorial and then people love it and you make it again and now we've got uh, well a lot of very loyal subscribers you know 500 or so instantly will watch our film right when we put it out and sometimes it's quite a bit more in it you know that's very encouraging so. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the altruism, right? Some scientists yeah. read this book and they're like, oh, "This seems really hard." This Rob guy is so helpful. I'm gonna get him to make my video. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, There's Morgan. Your money. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, Morgan, I have yet to have anybody read the book and then um, tell me what they thought of it. So you might be the first one, other than like me telling them to read it. <laughs> uh, we we self-published. We didn't know quite how the whole publishing world works. So I just said, "I'm gonna throw it up online and." Um, see if it works and li link to it in our videos and stuff and so you know yeah no, I mean, hundred people that have bought it but that's about it <laughs> uh, well well I'm about halfway through it I, I was I was going like a house of fire and then you know I got busy with everything else um, mm -hmm. but as somebody who's aspiring to to maybe one day getting more into various other media formats um, I, I find it find it very very helpful I mean I know my way around a camera for stills and all that but taking that next step to, to videography has been uh, you know, a bit of a challenge as I play around with it, but uh, so far I've, I've found it very, very helpful and useful. So, so I can't take all the credit. I co-wrote it with this guy, Dan Bertalan, FYI. In case, <laughs> in case you're watching it, Dan, I'm not taking all the credit. Um, <laughs> now we, we went back and forth on chapters. We didn't put our name on the chapters, but um, I'm guessing if there's a chapter you liked, it might have been my chapter. <laughs> we'll assume that's the case. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would recommend it for for people that are are interested in getting into into videography themselves, which is the bar to get into it is much much lower now with with uh, cell phones and and various other recording devices uh, that you know make this technology accessible. Um, so that's that's kind of the the one thing, the teaching side, but. Uh, I think we need to take a second and acknowledge the shiny thing on your shelf behind your head there. Maybe people that are watching on the video on YouTube rather than uh, the audio haven't uh, noticed it, but there's, uh, and we're getting into the season where these things start getting handed out. That's a that's an actual Emmy Award that you've won, is it not? <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, um, uh, I don't want to make it sound way better than it is. It is a regional Emmy, though. Um, and we got it for our film Mysteries of the Driftless, which we um, actually went on PBS in 2013. And uh, we basically traveled around this little known area of Wisconsin, Minneapolis, or Minnesota, Iowa, uh, Illinois. Um, made a documentary, and people really liked the style because it had kind of the style we talked about before, kind of a behind-the-scenes immersive style. And um, yeah, we got an Emmy from it. I was really happy about it. So. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good feather in the cap of a marine biologist, I'm not going to lie. 
Yeah, you know when my family comes, they always come in and like start taking pictures of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what your parents do, right? It's really kind of cute. That's awesome. And yay for the Midwest. I love <laughs> it. It's a beautiful, beautiful, underappreciated area. And I'm from there, so not my I, cannot, I cannot say I cannot say enough good things. <laughs> Awesome. Um, all right, so we got to wrap it up here. We're, we're at the end of the the episode, the end of time. Um, where can people follow along with with all of your projects that you're working on right now, Rob, and and see some of your work and teachings and and all that other stuff? Um, well, our website is Untamed Science, and we, and we do have a way to subscribe to kind of an update email, and we're that's where we put out everything every week. Um, but I would also encourage people to go to YouTube. And if you are interested in making films and stuff, we have a YouTube channel called Rob and Jonas's Filmmaking Tips. And if you're interested more in just learning about oddball science things, then our YouTube channel is untamedscience.com. And just to throw it out there, the one thing we are really passionate about trying to get going in the future is a channel that we have called The Curious Parent. And it's something that we don't think necessarily fits on Untamed Science, but for all of us who are new parents, there is not like a good source of like actual science about being a parent. You know, not judgmental, like wishy washy stuff, but anyway, maybe if you know any big roller friends, that's I'm pitching it there. <laughs> that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can see a lot of use for something like that uh, coming up in the future. So, um, so that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we'll have links to all of Rob's sites and and various videos, and we'll have examples, including um, his Emmy-winning documentary. We'll include a link to that as well, so you guys can go check it out. Those are all going to be on our website, which is at breakingbio.com. You can find us on Twitter at breakingbio or Facebook by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast. And of course, you can take us with you wherever you go, whether it's into the field or on your way into work. Uh, on iTunes or Stitcher. We need to thank the European Society for Evolutionary Biology, who provides us some outreach funding to allow us to do this. Uh, and we need to thank Rob for joining us this week and, and sharing all of his knowledge about filmmaking as well as the YouTube world. Uh, and, of course, there's marine biology in there as well. So thank you very much, Rob. Everybody listening at home, we'll be back next week with another episode, and I uh, hope you have a good week. Bye.